All right, all right. I'm Peter Alessandria, and for the next 90 minutes, I invite you to be bigger than you think you are. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. Let's take a look at our agenda for this evening. As usual, we're gonna start with some announcements, then we're gonna do our recommended readings, followed by the affirmation of the day. We'll do some introductions and victories. That's an opportunity for anybody who's new to introduce themselves or share a victory from the past week. Then we are going to do review part one only. I'll explain that in a minute. Take a break, come back, do some Q&A, and then we'll wrap it up. Probably going to finish early tonight for the reasons I'll explain in a minute. A reminder that tonight's workshop is being recorded and will be available on the BeBiggerToday.com website and YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. P please feel free to stop your video and mute your microphone if you do not wish to be seen or heard on the recording. Be Bigger Than You Think You Are second edition is now available on my website at bebiggertoday.com forward slash book. This is for the author signed paperback. It's available now on sale for $21.95. So check it out. And while you're there, check out my New York City photo book, New York Cityscapes, collaboration between myself and six other New York City area photographers. We each have our own unique take on the Big Apple and the skyline and landmarks that make New York City so great. So this is also available at bebakertoday.com forward slash bookstore, still on sale for $16.95. <clears throat> also have merch, hats, and t-shirts, save 20% with the discount code MERCH20 at checkout at bebiggertoday.com forward slash merch. And check out my original art and photography, my original landscape, cityscape, and abstract images. These are professionally framed, gallery wrapped canvas prints. And uh, you can get them at bebiggertoday.com forward slash art dash photography. And here's tonight's commercial. Peter's photos and abstract designs are uniquely beautiful, one-of-a-kind works of art. These gallery wrap canvas prints are set in a contemporary shadow box floating frame and will enhance the beauty of any home or office. Available in four different sizes, each piece is professionally framed and comes complete and ready to hang. Frames are available in your choice of black, white, or brown, and each is signed by the artist. Peter's original art and photography will make a great gift for a client, for yourself, or someone you love. Order yours today. Refrigerator magnets. These are my original photos on a collection of New York City refrigerator magnets. Check them out at bebiggertoday.com forward slash merch. And my most recent interview, TV interview, this was uh, for Biz TV, America Trends TV show on Biz TV. Go to my website, bebiggertoday.com. Look for this photo on the homepage and click on that and it will take you right to the interview. It's about, a, I think it's about 16 minutes long. We had a great conversation on overcoming our limiting thoughts and beliefs about ourselves and how that applies to business owners, creative people, and so on. And I am available for one-on-one -on -one coaching and or corporate consulting. So if you are a creative person, an artist, a photographer, a writer, or if you work for a company or have a company would like me to come in and speak to your sales team, your management team on how they could be bigger than they think they are, reach out to me through the website and we'll set that up. And finally, uh, in lieu of donations, I am asking people to purchase a copy of the second edition of the book. You can get it either on Amazon, just search Be Bigger Than You Think You Are, or my name, or uh, go to my website, uh, bebiggertoday.com forward slash book, and you get your copy there. All right, so speaking of books, we'll start off with our recommended reading tonight. Now, this was actually uh, my recommended reading way back when, uh, back when we started the workshop, and I wanted to revisit again this is the Conversations with God book series. There are currently four books in the series. There was an original trilogy. And then about two or three years ago, uh, Neil Donald Walsh, the author, he released uh, book number four. So now there's four books. 
Uh, I know I only have three on the screen. The middle one is actually, you can get books one, two, and three in one package with one book. So, um, and it's available as a hardcover paperback. I think it's available as a paperback. Actually, I'm not sure if it's available as a paperback. Uh, as an ebook or as an audiobook. So I have the audiobooks. And uh, I just highly recommend this to anybody who is just starting out on their own kind of spiritual exploration uh, or somebody who's been around for a while. You know, I first read these books back in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, and I came back to them last year. So it's almost 20 years later. And uh, it's actually over 20 years. And I found the material is as pertinent and as powerful as ever. And these, this is a great introduction to uh, different spiritual principles, metaphysical principles, our relationship with something greater than ourselves. So uh, I would highly recommend if you haven't already or if you haven't read them in a while, check out the Conversations with God book series. Neil Donald Walsh has a website, neildonaldwalsh.com, uh, and the books are available on Amazon, Audible, you know, wherever you get books. Now, this is the first part of the recommended reading, and then the second part are four more of his books from the Conversations with God series. So these are Friendship with God, Communion with God, The New Revelations, and Tomorrow's God. So you actually have eight books now in the series, and he's, he's actually written a bunch more, but I didn't want to put them all on here. Um, but these books, Friendship, Friendship with God uh, was, was kind of life-changing for me, and I quote from it in the second edition uh, when I talk about love relationships, love, um, commun communion with God, you know, just very powerful, very, very powerful. And then the new revelations in Tomorrow's God. So uh, I really high re highly recommend um, any and all of these books to anybody who might be interested. So again, you get them on his website, Amazon, um, you know, wherever you get books. Now let's look at our quote of the day today. This is another quote from Abraham Hicks. Uh, you guys may or may not know Esther Hicks, Law of Attraction. Uh, they do a daily email blast and they have a short quote um, this came out of uh, maybe two weeks ago. Your emotions are your indicator of how your active thought blends or doesn't blend with the thought source is thinking about the same subject in the same moment. Now, this is really, really important, guys. So we talk a lot about the power of our thoughts, the power of uh, a positive thoughts, the power of being conscious and aware of what we're thinking, what we're feeling, and then what we're saying or doing in any given moment. And what's very interesting about this is the way Abraham Hicks, Abraham describes emotion is that it's actually an indicator. It's like a signal, it's like a message from our source, our higher power, our higher self, our inner self, our intuitive self, whatever you want to call it, the part of us that's more connected to the big picture um, and, and is, has a higher level of awareness and consciousness. And so when, our, when we experience negative emotions, it's not because something bad is happening or about to happen or has just happened. It's that our thoughts, our perspective, our perception is out of alignment with the way our source sees the same situation, the same people in the same moment. So when I feel fear, we talked about this uh, last week, my definition of fear is an emotional response to a perception of ourselves as powerless and or unlovable in a given situation. So in that moment, when I feel fear, it's probably because I perceive myself, how I think about myself, how I see myself is either as unlovable or powerless. Now, the emotion that I feel in that moment, the negative emotion is actually an indicator. It's a message sent to me from my higher self, from my intuitive self, from my all-knowing self, that how I'm looking at myself and the situation in that moment is out of sync with how 
my source sees me. So a simple example is when I'm feeling powerless or unlovable, when I feel negative emotion, that's a message telling me that, no, 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 that's not the truth about you. That's not the truth about me. The way God sees me, the way my source sees me, the way my higher self sees me is not as powerless or, or as unlovable, but probably just the opposite. So negative emotion is always an indicator that we're out of alignment with how our higher self sees or is experiencing that moment. So that's kind of good news. We have, you know, real time information that the way we're looking at something is probably not the way it really is. And it's probably not going to serve us, especially in the long run. So it's an indicator that our perception is off. Our thought process is off. So it's very helpful to pay attention to our emotions. If for no other reason than what I've been talking about, which is negative emotions usually indicate negative thoughts. And as I've been saying since day one, it's really important to be aware of and then consciously choose our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. So again, the quote is, your emotions are your indicator of how your active thoughts blend how your active thought blends or doesn't blend with a thought source is thinking about the same subject in the same moment. So think about that. All right, so now is a portion of the workshop for people to introduce themselves or say hello. It's an opportunity to share any victories or celebrations from the past week. So who would like to kick us off for tonight? Which by the way, is not going to be the last night of the workshop. I'll talk about that in a moment. So who wants to say hi? Barbara. Hi, Peter. Yes, hi, Peter. I love that. I was kind of looking up, thinking about what you were saying. And then that last thing you just had on the screen was very interesting. And I was trying to read it and then you took it off. And I think it's so funny. You go, so think about it. <laughs> I was thinking about it. And I was thinking and my eyes were up. So um, can you, well, when you have a chance, put that back on the screen. I want sure. to read it one more. But what, you probably know it. What were you saying? It's very interesting because I have been working full time. Uh, you know, just she hasn't been there and I've been doing double duty. And, um, you know, it's interesting. It's very interesting because, you know, if you're busy, it's okay. But I had, oh, here it is. Your emotions are indicators of how your active thoughts blend, the thought blends. Okay, or doesn't blend with the, th with the thought source is thinking about the same subject in the same moment. And that was funny. And then you go, think about it. And I'm going, that takes a lot to think about. Um, all right, so we're gonna be leaving with, you know, I mean, you always talked about it, um, you know, negative emotions give negative um, reactions. Um, I don't know. It's just like, it's a constant battle. It's like constant, you know, I just, I, I, I can't even imagine always feeling good about yourself. <laughs> I guess that's going to be a wonderful thing someday. Cause it just doesn't happen. So, so I would suggest that it's not really that it's difficult. It's just that it's new okay. and it's going to take some getting used to, you know, the idea that we run our own lives. Nobody tells us that from when we're a kid, it's always, you make me feel, I don't make me feel. Yeah. And what you think of me depends on how I feel about myself. And then I learn from the messages that I get that there's some, there's, you know, that I'm upsetting to certain people in certain ways that I'm not good enough, I don't measure up, I disappoint people. You know, that's been a huge theme in my life, fear of disappointing people, fear of letting people down, fear of not being liked or accepted. And so I create a whole persona around that and a whole personality around that and a whole set of behaviors that flows from that personality. And now somebody's coming along and saying, all of that was just made up. 
There's no truth <laughs> to any of that. That's right. the result. We're just that's the great result city. of. A, that's the result of a six-year-old's thinking. Right. None of that was true. They were upset because they were upset because they didn't know they were responsible for their own feelings. Okay. Yeah. And they didn't know how to esteem us because nobody esteemed them in a healthy way. So we're, we're undoing the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years of our lives. It's going to take a little time. It's going to take a little effort and it's going to be a little uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah. I guess it's a big difference from last year to right now. So, uh, I can't. Imagine. All right. So then a year from now, it should be. Yeah, it should. It's going to take a lot of work. OK, it takes work. Yeah. Or, well, it takes. Let's put it this way. It, it, it takes intention. It takes what they call in 12 step programs. They talk about willingness. Yeah. And I've always said that willingness is just another word for courage. So it takes courage to change. I mean, it says it in the serenity prayer, the courage to change. It doesn't say, you know, power to change. It doesn't say the intellect to change. It says courage to change. Why does it say courage to change? Because change is scary. Change is stepping into the unknown. I talk about this in chapter four and chapter seven. My life may be miserable and I may, you know, my life may be a mess, but at least I know what to expect every day. <laughs> Right. It's when I start to change and I don't know what's coming tomorrow. I don't know if I can handle it. That's that's it takes courage to walk through that. So I would suggest that maybe you're like the butterfly, the, the caterpillar coming out of the cocoon, you know, and it takes, you know, here's the thing. I mean, it's like I don't know if this is true or not. But I heard that if you don't let if you help the, the caterpillar, the butterfly out of its cocoon, it, it will perish. It will die. There's something about struggling to get out of the cocoon. I don't know. Again, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's that struggle that, that builds something within the butterfly. So then it can, it can transform itself and metamorphosize or whatever it does to its next state. So I'm not liking you or anybody else to an insect, but there's that process of transformation and there's some struggle because it's not familiar, it's scary, there's self-doubt, you know, can I really do this? Can I really love myself that much? Can I really love other people that much? Do I want to love other people that much? You know, I kind of enjoy being angry at people sometimes. I kind of enjoy <laughs> judging people. Yeah, there's a wall. Yeah, there's some thickness. There's something to be said about that. Okay, I get it. All right, so and thanks. We're, we're you know, we're talking about giving all that up, especially when we talk about forgiveness. Yeah. It's giving up all that judgment, all that anger, all that justified righteousness, self-righteousness, superiority, selfishness. It's a big deal. You know, the conclusion I come to in chapter seven is that, you know, forgiveness is a radical way to live. Yes. Very People have really practiced it to the full. Right. And there's well, a lot of people that are there? trying to, yeah, and there's a lot of people like you that are trying to share it with people because they don't even have a clue. Okay. No, I understand. Okay. I'll keep so on I would on. suggest that the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it, which means maybe watching the videos during the week, you know, from the last workshop, maybe, you know, picking up the book, you know, just for 20 minutes a day and reading randomly out of the book, doing some kind of meditation, some kind of prayer, some kind of um, affirmations, you know, whatever. And, you know, for me, at least I got to do that every day because I'm going to do other stuff every day anyway. So it's just, you know, building this into the routine. No, I understand. I know that's where I'm at. Okay. So I'll think about it. I, like I keep this. telling you, Brian, I think you're doing, I think you're doing great. You no, know? I know. I do too. I do too. I think I'm doing great. I see, I see such a change. You know, I see it and I don't, you know, it doesn't matter if anybody else sees it. I see it. I know it is. 
I know I'm changing and that's all that matters and it's great. So I'm in a good place. All right, great. Who else wants to say hi or share a victory? Cynthia. Okay, thank you. I'm out picking green beans. And I want to say that green beans go, grow very rapidly. And it may we all grow as rapidly as the green beans. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We still have ones that are flowering. Flowering, lots of flowers. <laughs> wow. I would love to be as, um, as prolific as these green beans are. I really would. So may you be as prolific also and spread the word. Thank you. All right, great. I, I love the, I've never heard the analogy before, but I'll take it. I love it. Actually, I like green beans, although I haven't, I, I've, been, I've been doing lima beans lately. So I have to go back to my green beans. Thank you, Cynthia. Anybody else want to say hi or share a victory or what's growing in your garden? It's Didi. I want to try if I can do it without distortion here. Sound good, Didi. I can hear you. Okay, Can't great. So I'm not going to do video because I'm back. Uh, I'm back manifesting our trip to Trinity Springs, which is so important to my healing process. Here we go. Um, so I look forward to having one more week ahead of us to show up on film. But in the meantime, the affirmation was so powerful for me today because I had two full on um full on um moments or opportunities well i'll just say one was i directly had to because of my beliefs say no to something my employer told me to do and um and then the second one was there was a family kind of debate going and i was the only one on my side of the debate. So I talked to a family member, you know, who's willing to um, courageously debate with me. And both, both instances created the feeling of being separate. And that's the opposite of what you were saying is my source. When my source is telling me through my emotions that I'm not separate. And, um, I just want to remember that. I think that's hugely powerful. And then here's one for you, Peter. I don't need to read the or listen to the books because I've got you and I've got this training. And I just want to thank you for listening, reading all those books and continuing to bring those, to, uh, you know, to cherry pick the best of the best information and bring it forward so we can always like um, I heard just recently uh, grow prolifically and abundantly and, and um, you know, green beans all around. Anyway, love you all. Uh, I can't wait for the, the meeting tonight. Okay, pass. All right, great. Thanks, Didi. Um, yeah, I think, I, I, you know, it's, it's the word I was looking for before is, is uh, our, our emotions are a guidance system. And negative emotion is telling us that what we're thinking in that moment, what, how we're perceiving things is off base. And, you know, it's almost like we're relying on the ego, which we're going to talk a lot about tonight, as opposed to a higher level of consciousness, a higher level of awareness, which is who we are. That's my next book. So it's inside of us. It's our higher self. It's our source. It's the, it's the, the part of our psyche um, that's aware and conscious beyond what we seem to be aware and conscious of in our physical experience. So it's guidance, it's direction. So when we have negative emotions, it's not because something, I mean, something bad may happen because we're not acting, we're not thinking, feeling, speaking, or acting in alignment with source, but it's guidance. It's, it's, it's kind of like an early warning system. Something about what we're thinking, something about how we're perceiving the moment is off. So it's, um, it's truly direction, you know, direct, 
redirect, you know, based on that information. So, and yeah, as far as the books go, you know, I offer them, I think they're, they've been very helpful for me. Obviously the conversations with God book series. I mean, he's, you know, millions and millions of people have read those books. So, um, and soon millions and millions of people will be reading my books. Um, so I offer that to you guys, you know, if you want to listen to them or read them, great. If not, that's fine too. So anybody else want to say anything? Hi, Peter. I just had a question. If not so much for myself, but somebody else, like how, how like you had a, a 12 uh, step program, but like, how would somebody change negativity to a positive? Not, not, I mean, myself included, but somebody else I'm thinking of with like, besides counseling, like, how could you do it? Well, that's a great question, Michelle. And I think mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's, that's what's, that's what the book is all about. So mm -hmm. like at the end of each chapter, there are questions or exercises. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, there, there's stuff that I do, as I was mentioning earlier, things like um, meditation, visualization, you know, using my positive affirmations. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years and I can still get up in the morning and be in a really negative state. So I need to consciously and deliberately reprogram that stuff. And then it becomes just being more aware that, you know, what's happening out there doesn't have to affect me in a negative way unless I let it. So this is what I talk about in terms of taking our power back. How do you do that? <laughs> well, it takes practice. It takes determination. It takes awareness. But ultimately, it's just a decision, it's just a choice where, you, you know, where I say, I'm not going to let this bother me today. I'm not going to let this bother me ever again, or I'm going to, if it bothered me today, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to beat myself up for that. I'm not going to attack them for that. But tomorrow I recognize that I will have an opportunity to make a new choice. I mean, it really does come down to making a new choice in the moment about whether or not I'm going to be upset. Let's let something that's happening outside of me upset me. And one of the things that I've been harping on since the beginning is when I change how I see myself, when I see myself as powerful, when I see myself as able to take care of myself, when I learn how to set healthy boundaries, we we'll talk about that next week. It's chapter seven. We're not going to get to chapter seven tonight. Those things automatically change the way I interact with other people, with the situations in my life that challenge me. So it's about awareness. It's about, you know, if I, if I know that I have a difficult situation coming up with a client or with a family member or whatever, I plan ahead. I write down how I want that interaction to go, what I'm going to say, what I'm going to think, what I'm going to feel. Um, and then in the moment, I recognize that I have an opportunity, if I need to, to set boundaries. Hey, that's not okay. Please don't talk to me that way. Um, or you know, I'm not, I, I don't want to talk about this now, but I'll talk about it tomorrow. You know, some kind of negotiation with people. It's all practice. Okay. And having an action partner, you know, or I, you know, I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not a, co a, a counselor. I'm not a therapist, but I do kind of coach people. Um, or just find somebody else who's interested in making some changes, tell them about the book and work on it together. Okay. I have Sounds to say, good. I mean, the exercises are really important in, in each chapter. It's not, uh, for me, it's not enough just to read the book. Got to do the exercises. Okay. Like the Thank people you. That, I, that I coach, I say, you know, we're going to work on the exercises. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Anybody else? All right. So <laughs> let me tell you guys what's up. So we're actually, I didn't even have a chance. I ran out of time. I didn't even have a chance to change the slide. I was, I spent about, it was probably close to five hours today trying to do all the slides for the review. And I couldn't, I didn't even have enough time to finish. I literally was eating dinner like 10 minutes before I sat down here tonight uh, because I just didn't have enough time to finish. So 
And chapter seven is by far the longest chapter in the book. So it's almost 60 pages. So what I'm going to do is if you guys want to show up next week, I'll be here. I think what I'm going to do is not even do any announcements, not any, not even do any introductions and victories. We'll, we'll, we'll have some time at the end, but there's so much material to cover in chapter seven that I think I'm just going to launch right into it at the beginning of the workshop next week. And hopefully that'll be enough to get through it. I really feel like it's an important chapter. The material is really important. So I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to try and push through it tonight. And, and like I said, I didn't, I didn't even have the slides finished. So, so we're going to do chapter six. Chapter six is, would you rather be right or happy? So I'm going to launch in now. And we might even, I don't, well, actually, I don't know if we're going to end early, but, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. So a key part of chapter six in our discussion was talking about the ego. Now, the ego is defined in a lot of psychological literature. Of course, Freud was the first person to talk about the ego. Um, but even today, Eckhart Tolle, he, he talks a lot about the ego. And of course, A Course in Miracles describes it. We're kind of uh, anthropo anthropo anthropomorphizing the ego by kind of talking, at it as, talking about it as a separate entity. But it's it's a part of our personality. It's a part of our psyche. It's a part of our, our, our mental structure. Um, but I do think it's helpful to kind of separate ourselves off a little bit from it. So I'm talking about it as if it's something not necessarily external to us, but something separate within us. So um, first part here is the ego is a selfish, vengeful part of our minds that comes out when we feel threatened. It thrives on conflict and drama and feels slighted and attacked by other people for any reason or no reason at all. The ego divides the world into two groups, those that are for us and those that are against us. It tells us we're special while at the same time leaving us shackled with insecurity and self-doubt. When the ego is in charge, we can act defensively and take things personally. Now, what I have to say about all this is we, we've learned to rely on the ego because we haven't learned to see ourselves in a more empowered way. The key is to notice when we feel justified in attacking someone. So as I always say, the most important question to ask in any situation that challenges us is who do you think you are? How do you see yourself? So when I see myself as vulnerable, when I see myself as threatened, when I see other people as having power over me, um, that's when the ego comes up. That's when it kind of kicks into gear. And there's an evolution from the best I can tell. Again, I'm not a psychologist, but from the best I can tell, there's an evolutionary basis to all this. You know, back when we were those little tree dwelling mammals, it was probably in our best interest to be suspicious, to be selfish, to be uh, hypervigilant, to be distrustful, especially members of a different tribe or something like that, because, you know, it, it was, you know, it could be pretty crazy back then. Now, some would argue nothing has changed. I would say a lot has changed, but we'll save that discussion for another time. So the point is, the ego, you know, in and of itself, the ego isn't bad. It's also our sense of separateness, our sense of identity. And, you know, who we are is part of our ego. But it's very important, especially when we get to the discussion of forgiveness, to recognize that the ego creates more problems than it solves at this point. And it creates conflict. It creates drama. Uh, you know, I notice now that when I take something personally, when I feel slighted, I recognize right away that's the ego. And then I have to make a choice. Do I want to continue to think and perceive in that way, or do I want to shift to a higher state of consciousness, you know, a more loving, a more open, a more peaceful frame of mind? Now, what I talk about is, um, let me skip this, yeah. So, uh, one aspect of the ego is this thing called projection. 
Projection is a process whereby we deny the existence of an unfavorable trait in ourselves by attributing it to others. Now, projection is a defense mechanism. We project those traits which are too painful for us to look at, to look at directly. In 12-step programs, they say, if you spot it, you got it. So what that means is if I see something in another person, let's say I see somebody as being uh, boastful or a braggart. If I react to that trait in that person in a negative way, especially if it's an extreme reaction, if I get really righteous about it or if I get really judgmental about it, um, if I want to tell people you know, what a jerk that guy is because he's always bragging about himself, chances are pretty good that that's an aspect of my own personality that I haven't accepted, I haven't made peace with. If I don't have that extreme reaction, and I, you know, we notice, you can notice something like that. Uh, actually, I'll get to this in a minute. So if I have the extreme reaction in my experience, and I, I know other people talk about it in this way, chances are pretty good that that's a part of my own personality that I haven't accepted, that I haven't made peace with, it's a part of myself that I disown. Now, as I talked about in the book, you know, sometimes you go to the other extreme. So instead of being a braggart, now I'm excessively humble, you know, humility. I never talk about myself. I go to the other extreme. But if I still have that negative reaction to somebody bragging, it's still based on the fact that that's a part of myself that I haven't accepted. It's a part of myself that I probably dislike. I'm just covering it up with excessive humility, but it's still there. So projection always follows denial and or disassociation. By reacting strongly and negatively to what someone else is doing, we're denying that the source of our discomfort is within us. Because remember, nobody makes us feel anything. Why should somebody bragging cause a negative reaction in me? They don't have any power over me. In fact, they're probably not even talking about me. They're talking about themselves. So why should I be upset by that? Well, because there's something within me that can't accept that and probably sees that as a part of my own personality. And I've disowned that. This was, I recommended a while ago, two books by a woman named Debbie Ford, Dark Side of the Light Chasers and The Secret of the Shadow. And Carl Jung talked a lot about the shadow, that part of our personality that we push down, the parts of ourselves that we don't accept, that we don't love. We try to push it away. We try to deny it. But it's like hold, trying to hold the beach ball under the water. It's, it's, it's going to pop up at some point and probably at the most inappropriate time. So instead of trying to push down all those negative traits that we don't like about ourselves or projecting them out onto other people, it's an opportunity for us to heal those. And I talk about this, I think in chapter four, you know, when I did step six in my 12 step programs, that was my opportunity to really look at all these negative personality traits and begin to heal them. And the way to heal them, you know, the root of the word heal is to make whole. So instead of pushing that stuff away, I embrace those traits. I began to understand why and I'll, we'll talk about it later, but I began to understand why I have those traits. And instead of hating myself for that, I forgive myself for it. Number seven, if the issue we're noticing in the other person isn't ours, then we probably won't be overly bothered by it. We may not like it, but we won't feel compelled to attack them for it. And we may even try to help them, like in a positive way maybe pull them aside and just kind of point out to them in a, in a non-threatening way, hey, you know, this is what I noticed. Um, just wanted to share that with you. Um, and, and by the way, when I do that, it has this effect on people. You know, something instead of judging them, attacking them, wanting to make them wrong for having that personality trait. So that's projection. And then my experience, I actually had this, um, when I did my sixth step in Codependence Anonymous, I looked at, I looked at this um, personality trait that you could call neediness, especially in my romantic relationships. I could be very needy, and that means I'm looking for somebody else to tell me I'm okay, to affirm me, 
to um, pay attention to me, to make me feel good about myself, you know, like it's their job to emotionally caretake me. And when I did my six step inventory, I looked at that as a character defect and I really got into it and I kind of broke it down and I could see that that trait was my dysfunctional way of trying to feel good about myself, trying to get the love and approval that I needed. And I didn't know how else to get it because I didn't really feel valuable. I didn't really feel lovable. So, and I didn't have that within myself. So I was trying to get that from other people. So what I did is I actually worked on that and I forgave myself for it. And what I'm, well, the reason I'm sharing that is seeing neediness in other people used to trigger me all the time. And I was very judgmental. Like if I was with a girlfriend and she was needy, you know, I was very judgmental of that. And what I was doing was projecting my own discomfort onto her. I was projecting my own feelings about myself onto her. When I forgave myself for that, when I did the work, you know, I'm not triggered by that anymore. I may notice it. And like I said, if it's appropriate, I may try to be helpful, but it doesn't, tr it doesn't push my buttons. It's not an issue. I don't have to judge somebody for that. I don't have to make them wrong for that. And for me, I believe that's true of, of all of these traits, all of these characteristics that we react negatively in other people, react negatively to in other people. Number nine, the real reason we react, now, so I'm switching gears a little bit here, and this is when somebody criticizes us instead of us criticizing them. The real reason we react negatively when someone criticizes us is not because of what the other person is saying or doing. It's because we're afraid they might be right. So if you remember in chapter six in the book, I have that archery example where, um, you know, I say, pick, pick a activity that you're not, um, you don't have an investment in something that's not important to you. For me, that's archery. I don't really care about archery. I haven't done archery since I was in the ninth, uh, uh, since I was nine years old at sleepaway camp. And so if somebody criticizes me and says, you're the worst archer I know, you suck, pack up your quills and go home. You know, it's a joke. I don't really care. But if somebody criticizes me about my photography, like if I have an investment in seeing myself in a certain way as a photographer and somebody criticizes me and I feel offended, if I feel indignant, if I take offense to that and I have my feelings hurt, it's, all, it's not because of what they said. It's because I'm afraid they're right. See, when I feel good about myself, when I recognize my own talent and ability, my self-worth, it doesn't matter what somebody else says or doesn't say about me. It doesn't upset me because I feel good about myself. So I'm, I'm suggesting that when we feel negatively when somebody criticizes us, it's only because we're afraid they're right. So if I work on myself, and I get to that place of seeing worth and value and loving myself, it doesn't matter what other people say. This leads into the next part of the discussion, self-confidence. I define self-confidence as a trusting relationship with myself. We trust ourselves to be kind to ourselves rather than attack ourselves for our mistakes. It also means we can depend on ourselves not to abandon ourselves in the face of a negative comment or criticism by others. So remember when I, years ago, I, was, I thought, gee, you know, my problem is I lack confidence. So I went to the dictionary and I looked up the definition of the word confidence. And, and there was, a, you know, the, the definitions you would expect, self-assurance, you know, uh, and all of that. But then further down, there was of the word con of a confidence was a trust. The definition of a confidence is a trusting relationship. So I took that to mean that well, self-confidence must be a trusting relationship with myself. And that means trusting myself to be nice to myself in the face of somebody else's criticism, in the face of somebody else's, so I don't abandon myself. And it goes beyond that. But I wanted to point that out in the, in the context of this discussion. Moving on to 12, anger. So anger is the primary egoic reaction. The ego always has to be mad about something. Emotional pain or discomfort are usually our justification for being upset. 
Who we think we are when we're angry is threatened, vulnerable, powerless, et cetera. In many cases, the message behind the anger is, I'm upset and it's your fault. So anger, we wanna be aware of when we're in, we're in that egoic reaction, the, the justified anger, um, you know, hostility, annoyance, resentment, those are all expressions of anger. And we're gonna talk about this in a minute. For many of us, anger is the way we try to protect ourselves and our relationships when we feel hurt or slighted, or we feel potential loss or damage. You know, anger is our reactive mode. But I would suggest that that's, we're in the ego, the ego gets angry, our, our higher self, our more centered self doesn't respond with anger. And it's always a reaction of who we think we are in that situation, how we see ourselves. So when I react with anger, it's because I see myself as powerless, meaning I can't take care of myself, meaning something bad is about to happen and there's nothing I can do about it. So the anger is not caused by what they're doing or not doing. The anger is caused by how I see myself. A Course in Miracles says, we're never angry at a fact but rather our subjective interpretation of that fact. And in fact, the course goes further. It says, anger is never justified. Now, if we're not angry at a fact, but rather we're angry at, our, at the subjective interpretation of that fact, then, we, and we talked about this in chapter one, chapter two, I talked about that internal filtering process where information comes in from the outside world passes through our internal filter, which is based on how we see ourselves in that situation. And as the information goes through that filter, we come to a conclusion. We come to, we give the situation a meaning based on that, that filtering process. And we react to the meaning. We're not actually reacting to what's going on out there. It's our subjective interpretation. But the subjective interpretation is based on who we think we are, how we see ourselves which may have nothing to do with what's actually going on out there. So if I'm getting angry at my subjective interpretation rather than what's actually happening, you know, I may want to look at that. I may want to at least take a pause and say, wow, maybe I'm not seeing this clearly. Maybe the negative emotion is a message, an indicator, guidance from my higher self saying, wait a second, you're not seeing this clearly right now. And you're about to say something or do something that you're going to regret later. So what's upsetting us is how we see ourselves, not what's, not what's going on around us. If this is tough to swallow, it's probably because many of, us, many of us equate giving up anger with giving up protection. So we're going to talk later, actually not tonight, we're going to talk next week about boundaries. Now, I spent a lot of time when we were on chapter seven talking about boundaries. I'm going to suggest that boundaries are the way we take care of ourselves in our relationships instead of resorting to anger, resentment, you know, trying to get even, revenge, retaliation, and all of that. So there is another way to take care of ourselves, to protect ourselves, so we don't need anger in our relationships. All right, moving along, a hallmark of our ego is that it takes everything personally. This is because, not surprisingly, the ego is egocentric. It makes what other people say and do about us, even though it's not. So again, I just want to point out, if, if I'm taking things personally, I'm in my ego. If I'm offended, if I feel slighted, I'm in my ego. It doesn't mean what they're saying or doing is appropriate. It doesn't mean what they're saying or doing is fair. It doesn't mean what they're saying or doing is, you know, kind. Or I'm not making excuses for their bad behavior. But how I feel is always about me. And I have the ability, true power, the ability to consciously choose and or change my thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. And I don't have to be affected by what somebody else is saying or doing. So be on the lookout for when you take things personally. Oh, 
We're going to take our break now. It's a five-minute break. Uh, if you're new here, this song is Love My Life by Robbie Williams. I can't actually play it on YouTube, so you have to go find your, the song for yourself. But the lyrics are going to be on screen. Very life-affirming lyrics. We'll be back in five minutes.
All right, so we are back. We're going to jump right in and continue the discussion because we got a lot more here. So we're continuing chapter 6, 17. When we use anger, we may be trying, perhaps without even being aware of it, to get even by using our words and actions to inflict harm or injury upon the other person. So again, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, there, I talk about this in the book. There may be instances when we need to raise our voice to get somebody's attention. You know, this is particularly true with kids. You know, if kids are acting in an unsafe way, you want to get their attention. But sometimes we may not even be aware of it, but we're trying to hurt somebody. We're trying to get even. We're trying to inflict injury because of what we think they did to us. So if I'm going to react strongly, I want to be aware, you know, what am I, what's my motivation? What's my, you know, what's driving this response right now? And to be more aware of that. Now, this is really important. So if we're lashing out in anger, we're lashing out because we're afraid. Now, I never really realized this. And this is because fear always precedes anger. So what this says is, when I'm angry, I'm really afraid. And knowing that is really important. Anger is a response to feeling threatened to feeling concerned, to the, the feeling of danger, imminent danger. And so, as I'm going to describe in a minute, it's really helpful to know that. Because what happens now, let's say I'm having an argument with somebody else, expressing fear is usually more conducive to opening lines of communication with another person. Because if anger is about blaming someone else for how we feel, the natural response of the other person is to either shut down or fight back, both of which limit communication. Anger begets anger. But when we communicate that we're afraid, we're usually not a blaming or accusing the other person. And so their defenses don't get triggered and they're much more likely to listen. And if they're more likely to listen, then it's more likely that we'll reach a resolution. So if somebody's doing something that I find inappropriate, it's, if I go at them and, and, and lash out at them and attack them and yell and scream and all of that out of anger, they're not going to really be interested in what I have to say. There's not going to be any ground for discussion. There's not going to be any line of communication. Now they're shut down or they're going to fight back. Whereas if I go to somebody and I say, gee, you know, I'm really concerned about this. I'm really worried about this. I'm afraid that if you do that, this is going to happen. That's a whole different conversation. And now I'm not blaming them. I'm not accusing them. I'm expressing to them how I feel. And then I'm inviting communication. And they may even become an ally. They may even become the, uh, 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 you know, somebody who can help me in that situation. But if I'm not aware that I'm lashing out because I'm angry rather than because I'm afraid, just happened just now. I can't tell you what's going on, but just I communicated to somebody without anger and without attacking them, without making them wrong, and I got the response that I wanted. Whereas if I attack them, I'm sure I would not have gotten the response that I wanted. So by expressing fear, we open lines of communication. And, and all we're really doing, I mean, that's the truth. You know, if fear is underlying all our anger, then all we're really doing is speaking the truth. But we have to be willing to feel a little vulnerable. You know, we have to be willing to kind of give people the benefit of the doubt. We have to be willing to let our guard down a little bit. 21. So now we're going to shift the conversation to judgment. So ju judgment is our subjective determination that someone or something is bad and not in a Michael Jackson kind of way. Rip MJ. We're essentially saying that that person or thing is unworthy of our love. Judgment fosters separation, a key egoic belief. And like defensiveness, it's a coping mechanism. It's an attempt to keep ourselves safe 
by separating, by being separate from others. So, um, actually, I'll use this camera. So again, this came out of my six step work and it was probably Codependence Anonymous. And I was looking at this character defect of judgment and this personality trait. And what I found was that judgment is a coping mechanism. It was a way that I tried to feel safe by being separate from somebody else. Because if I judge you as unworthy of my love, if I judge you as not good enough, then I don't have to get close to you. And if I don't have to get close to you, you can't hurt me. So it's, it's a coping mechanism. It's a defense mechanism. And it also comes out of our fear of our own, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. Judgment is, is an indicator of our own insecurity. Like when I feel good about myself, I don't have to judge somebody for the, the clothes they're, they're, they wear or the car they drive or the house they live in or whatever. When I feel not so good about myself, when I feel insecure, I'm gonna look at everybody else and try and make them wrong so, so I can feel better than them. It's about feeling superior, feeling better, because inside I feel less than. So judgment is a coping mechanism. It's a way to feel, as I said, safe. And it's also a way to feel better than other people when we feel less than. So judgment is truly, you know, it, it, it's, it, for me at least, it's truly an indicator of, of my insecurity, of my lack of self-worth. Judgment fosters separation. I already said that. When we judge someone, we're attacking them. This may be a silent attack in our own minds, or we may make the attack public by announcing our judgment to others. So this is kind of what gossip is. You know, when I'm gossiping about somebody, you know, I'm, I'm bringing other people into my mental activity, and gossiping is usually not favorable. It's usually it's judgmental. It's usually trying to cut somebody down. It's one thing to do that in my own head. It's another thing when I start to bring other people in, you know, and, um, you know, and uh, it's just a choice, you know, is that who I want to be? You know, how do I see myself in this situation that I got to cut somebody else down and tell other people about it, you know, that I have to have to, um, you know, bring other people into my little insanity. So I want to be aware of that. So I have a no gossip rule. Probably you guys know me as well as anybody. I don't think you've ever heard me gossip about anybody. Um, I try very hard to be conscious of that. I've tried very hard to be conscious of when I'm being judgmental, of when I'm being and, and, and recognizing that if I'm being judgmental, it's only for one reason. And that is because I feel insecure. And I only feel insecure for one reason. And that's because of how I see myself, who I think I am. 24, since the ego lives by comparisons and is inherently insecure, it is, it's almost always afraid other people are better than us. Not wanting to feel less than, the ego quickly turns around and judges the other person first. So it's my position that our judgments define us, not the other person. When we judge someone based on something as trivial as the clothes they wear, we must really see ourselves as less than. Just admiring my tie. So just be aware of that, you know, and just recognize, is this who I want to be? Do I want to be judgmental? Do I want to gossip about other people? Do I have to, you know, knock other people down so I can feel good about myself? You know, um, for me, that was a real problem. And so I try not to do that anymore. All right, so now we're moving on. Title of the chapter is, would you rather be right or happy? Being right or happy are mutually exclusive. You can be one or the other, but not both. Now, I used to think being right made me happy, but it turns out that being right is antithetical to our happiness. The problem is we all see right and wrong from our own perspectives. We decide these things based entirely on our subjective interpretation of the situation. But here's the real problem. In order to be right, 
we have to make someone else wrong. The reality is making someone else wrong never makes us truly happy. And I think this is where a lot of people get caught up. You know, we can be very judgmental. We can be very righteous. We can be, you know, uh, feeling we're superior, that we're right. The other person is wrong. Become smug about that. And it's not about being correct or incorrect. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's about being right. And being right means we have to make somebody else wrong. And, and to our ego, that feels great. Our ego loves it when we're better than other people, when we're right and they're wrong and we can prove that. But our soul, our higher self, our true self, it never feels good to make somebody else wrong. They may be incorrect, and we'll talk about how to handle that situation in a second, but that's different than them being wrong. Us being right so we can make them wrong. So we don't need to attack other people to prove we're right. We can learn to correct others without making them wrong. This is especially important when dealing with children. If we make kids wrong for their lack of knowledge, often enough, we can undermine their self-esteem. So instead of shaming, blaming, or ridiculing them for their mistakes, we want to communicate the correction with understanding, compassion, and love. So again, this relates to what I was talking about earlier in terms of we don't have to use anger to protect ourselves. We don't have to make somebody else wrong so we can feel right better than and all of that. And if they truly are incorrect, let's say they have misjudged the situation, they don't have all the information, you know, maybe the, the um, premise that they're operating from is not accurate. We don't have to attack them for that. You know, there's a way to communicate that, which is, hey, you know, I really appreciate what you're saying. You know, I understand where you're coming from. You know, have you thought about this? Or, you know, gee, I see it a little differently. And I found out recently that this, this, and this is true. And because that's true, then that would mean that this would make more sense in this situation. What do you think about that? Instead of, you know, you're an idiot, you know, go back to school, you know, shaming them, attacking them for their incorrect conclusions, their incorrect positions. Think about how different social media would be. You know, if instead of attacking other people for their ideas, you know, we either ignored it or we responded in a way that was actually helpful, that was kind, you know, um, how different would that be? The only reason I have to attack you is if I feel threatened by you. And the only way I can feel threatened by you is if I see myself as somehow being vulnerable somehow being powerless, somehow not being able to take care of myself. So when I do my homework, which is get my self-image in a really good place where I feel good about myself, it's not that I don't listen to suggestions. It's not that I don't take feedback. I can even listen to constructive criticism, but I don't take things personally. And then I don't have to attack other people for their ideas. I don't have to make them wrong for how they see things, for who they are, because I've done my work on me. I've gotten to that point where I'm secure in who I am. I love who I am. I love myself even when I screw things up or make mistakes. I forgive myself. And, and, and so because I'm not making myself wrong, I don't have to make other people wrong. And by the way, that's why making other people wrong is so hurtful for us because we don't even know it yet, but we're all one. We're all connected. So when I make them wrong, I'm really making myself wrong. That's the next book. All right. Oh, that's it for chapter six. All right, good. So we're actually close to time. So um, let's do this. So let's open it up for discussion. And then we'll, we can, we'll probably end right on time tonight for a change. So who wants to share about any of that? The ego, judgment, anger, criticism, insecurity and how we can turn all that around. Dee. Dee. Hey, Peter. Hey, everybody. Um, I love this. This is so perfect for me today. 
I, t- I mentioned in my victory that I actually had to say no to a request that was made of me and to a very, very important person. So my, my no was about a boundary for myself because the request as I, as I um, deduced it would have caused harm. And it was, it's not, it's not part of my um, willingness to knowingly cause harm. And I was able to just say, no, it's, you know, it's against my morals and let it, and let it go and, you know, walk away and um, continue the dialogue with other interested parties um, uh, uh, that would represent what Peter said was about, hey, you know, there's this, this, and this. And um, and then I get to go and show up and not take any of it personally and just know that my decision was, you know, regardless of what they do about me making that decision, I, I would again make that decision knowing what I know. And... Um, you know, so ideally the outcome is, you know, that unfortunately in this case, um, I don't get to, uh, I don't get to, to have the veto, but I do get to, to vote. So yes. So my, um, it's not for me, the whole process in this case, and actually all of my life now, it's not about being right, but being willing to back up my decisions and support being willing to do, you know, to, as a boundary for self-care, regardless of the outcome, and just being in support of, in loving support of, you know, the whole container uh, on the decision-making process moving forward, because I am, I don't get the veto. I'm not the veto in this situation. I get a vote because I'm a trusted servant. At least I was this morning. We'll see about tonight. Um, because I'm a trusted servant and I, and I know the boundary of needing to use my voice because I must, I must um, represent, you know, my, more, my beliefs, I, I, you know, my boundaries. I have to take care of myself. It's about I must take care of myself regardless of the outcome. Um, of course, I, I, I'll be fine if I'm right. And it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that I did my self-care. I believe in, you know, my actions and that I will support if they retain me, I will support the people who do have the veto and it's not me. I get a vote. I don't get the veto. And, but that doesn't mean I have to do the thing that I know causes harm. Um, I don't have to do that. As long as they don't make me do that, then I'll stay. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, appreciate, I so appreciate it. It's such a timely conversation, and there's opportunity for me to have a lot of forgiveness for self and others. And so I'll keep coming back. I'll be here next week. Thanks, Peter. All right, great. Thanks, Didi. I heard a lot of good stuff in there. Everything from self care to being true to yourself. Um, you know, the humility of of recognizing that you have a, a role to play, a job to do but also being true to yourself. So it's great. It's good. Heard a lot of good stuff. Anybody else want to chime in on any of the topics for tonight? Barb? Yeah. Um, Tomorrow afternoon, I'm spending the afternoon with the grandchildren. And I have been doing this, um, you know, I guess every two months or something like that, we'll go out to lunch and then we'll spend a little time. Um, I guess because they have time on their hands. And I've recognized that, uh, well, when they were younger, it was great to be super grandma. But now that they're a little older, and I think you know that, um, so what I will do tomorrow, and I've done it before, is totally take the ego out of it. Like you said, to just be present, to just listen to them. I mean, you know, grandparents want to be, or grandmother, you know, I want to be, I want them to think that I'm the greatest thing in the whole world. And with all that you're talking about tonight, I've got to put that aside. I've got to, I guess that's the ego. And, you know, it just seems like a shame, but that's what I want. And I really have 
I'm really going to have time to go through the whole practice of it tomorrow. I did notice it the last time I was with them that I did take, say, the ego out of it. Like you said, unsolicited, no unsolicited advice, just be present. And it went so much better than it used to go. So I'm hoping that tomorrow will go even better. I mean, I would, you know, my, my greatest joy would be to sh play that song for them. I don't think they're ready for it yet. I mean, I picture it. I'm listening to the song during the break. And I said, can you imagine grandma just whipping out that song to two teenagers? And they would look at me like, are you crazy? But it has such wonderful things in it. And I'm going to try to remember the song and, and, Hopefully, that's what you want to do is, um, I don't know, you always want to make a difference in people's lives. And especially, uh, I ha I'm sure your own children, but grandchildren are the greatest things in the world. So I'm spending my afternoon with the grandchildren, and I have another week to explain it to you when I come back. When <laughs> we come back next week, okay? Yeah, that's right. You'll have another chance to talk about it. Yeah. Um, but, but you know how it is. I mean, this whole change that we're going through or I'm going through Peter is that um you know nobody else knows you're going through it but you want you know it's just wonderful it's it's um pleasurable let's put it that way good it's a good way to look at it yeah and you know people they pick up on it other people pick up on it people notice um a couple of things I was going to say um I just went out of my head. Look, if the worst thing that we want to do in life is love our grandchildren, then, you know, we're doing pretty well. Yeah. You know, it's okay to want to love people. It's okay to want to be there for them. It's okay to want to guide them. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, we, we do want to be conscious. We do want to be aware of how we deliver that, that, that caring, that love. Um, especially as they get older, you know, now they're getting to a point where, you know, the best thing we can do sometimes, I think, is allow people to experience the consequences of their own choices and actions, because that's how they're going to learn. And if they want advice, they'll come to us. And if they don't, you know, <clears throat> now in terms of our, our grandchildren thinking we're the greatest thing, you know, it's like, if I think I'm the greatest thing, or if you think you're the greatest thing, then it really won't matter what they think. That was kind of the whole point earlier. I know. That's what I said. And that's what I'm, so that's what I'll take with me tomorrow. Go ahead. Well, so, you know, it's just love who you are as much as you can. And if you, let's say you make a mistake tomorrow, you know, there's no such thing as a bad choice or wrong decision if we do two things. Learn from our mistakes and forgive ourselves for them. So you will learn if, let's say you do, I'm not saying you will, but let's say you do make a mistake in some way, you know, it'll be an opportunity to learn something and, and to practice forgiveness. So, um, you know, a lot of times, especially I think with teenagers, you know, it's just important to be there. And, and, and really be quiet a lot of times. I know, I know. I love the story of you said you had to sit outside the diner, so that's, uh, I don't think they're going to do that to me, but uh, tomorrow, but that, that is funny. You were there, but yet you weren't there. <laughs> well, even, even, you know, like when I go out with, when I take my, my niece is 15, when I take her for dinner or something like that, you know, I talk, but if she doesn't want to talk, I don't push it. I know. Just being know. there, just being present. You know, and I'll share what I have to share. And then if she wants to continue the conversation, we do. If she doesn't, you know. Yeah. So it's many she, things. But, you know, you really, you know, talked a lot about the ego. And so that's why I brought it up. I'm putting my ego um, right where it's supposed to be. <laughs> and again, it's not bad or wrong to have an ego. Uh huh. So we don't want to judge ourselves for judging ourselves. We don't want to judge ourselves for, for, for having an ego. That kind of, that's the ego judging our, you know, the ego. <laughs> yeah, that is funny. So it's just notice it. And, and if you really want to have fun with it, you can laugh at it. Oh, there I go again. <laughs> right. There I go again. You know, and just make light of it. 
because the truth is, you know, at least for me, I spent so much time in my ego without realizing that's where I was. So now when I catch myself there, it's like, I can laugh about it sometimes. So it's little baby steps. You know, you're a great grandmother. I'm sure they, that in, in, in their own way, they appreciate you. And one day you'll know that for sure. If you don't now, you know, and, and again, part of it is just, you know, just being in their presence, let them lead the, the, the conversation, you know, whatever. And what occurred to me, a thought that occurred to me was maybe write down those lyrics from the song on a card, birthday card, or maybe write them as poetry. You know, that's, that sounds great. Yes. To get it. Yes. Cause I do want to somehow express those things that are in the song to them. I think it's a great, you know, you know, it, it's a great thing to express to anybody, but um, certainly to your family or the people you love. Okay. All right. Thanks, Peter. Great idea. Good Barb. Keep us posted. Okay. <laughs> Who else? Cynthia looked like you were ready to go. There we go. Um, I just want to say thank you. All the things you were talking about tonight and the things you're going to talk about next week are so pertinent for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. All right, good. Anybody else? All right, we'll play the song one more time and then we'll come back for our final goodbyes. So we'll see you guys next week, just like the slide just said. So, um, so that's it for tonight. That's it for this week. Next week, as I said, we're just going to launch right into it. I don't think I'm going to do announcements. We'll save the, the uh, interaction for the end of the, of the workshop because there's a lot. This was only uh, eight or ten slides. I've already got tw I haven't even finished yet, and I have 25 slides for the last chapter. And I'm trying to cut it down, so... All right, so you guys want to say anything? Barb? No, you? I was going to say goodnight. I'm leaving. <laughs> All right. And looking forward to next week, really. Thank All you. All right, great. Thank you. All right, guys. So be bigger than you think you are today and every day. Have a great week, and I'll see you guys next week for our final regularly scheduled workshop. Bye, guys.